you may not know, but we do try to have an annual social innovation lecture. It's a sort of uh, a way of telling the world what is going on, what is interesting, and what is new. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Emily Schuchberg, um, who I'm sure many of you have Googled already, and there's pages and pages and pages. Um, Emily uh, is director of Cambridge Zero, I'm sure she'll mention what it is. She's also a professor of environmental data. data science. Sounds and sound that exciting, but <laughs> he's a climate scientist, has done a lot of work in, in, in the Arctic. And Emily is obviously really connected across the globe, uh, but one of her key jobs is making Cambridge University uh, better at its carbon impact. Is that correct? It's a hard job. That's all going to do it. Thank you, Emily. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so, as you might guess, what I'm going to talk to you today about is the intersection between climate innovation and innovation in terms of solutions um, to the climate challenge and social, social innovation. I thought I'd start off um, with this picture here, um, partly because it's a beautiful picture of Cambridge for all those of you who are alumni, um, but also because there is a message within it which I think is important um, in one respect. This is one of the most iconic views of, of Cambridge, um, and uh, it used to be a beautifully ploughed lawn, uh, a beautifully mowed lawn with all the traditional stripes until three years ago um, when a section of that lawn was turned into a wildflower um, meadow. Um, this has been so, so, so hugely successful that uh, apparently the intention is now to turn most of the, the lawn into a wildflower meadow. And it's been really interesting because the first year it was planted with wildflower seeds and apparently this summer I was there um, earlier this week, this summer, um, some, uh, they, they've managed to identify orchids growing up in the lawn, which haven't been planted. The last time that this wasn't a heavily mowed lawn was in the 1770s. So those seeds have been buried in a seed bank all, all that time and have eventually now emerged out into the soil. So it's a wonderful story of regeneration, um, but it's also a story in that it's a hugely iconic project which we're already seeing is inspiring others to do similar projects. And so that was the message that I thought was useful out of this, is that you know, iconic projects can really help to instill societal change that is much greater than just planting a few seeds on one particular small patch of land in Cambridge. The other iconic project that King's College are undertaking at the moment, actually, if you go down King's Parade, you might see lots of scaffolding, and they're putting um, solar panels on the top of the chapel roof, um, which was a huge battle with historic England to get approval. But again, societal change as a result. Now that that's been approved on King's College Chapel, they were telling me that every other cathedral in the country has been phoning them up, asking them how they can do the same, and etc. You start to get um, this cascading of impacts. Um, before I move on to the, to, the, to the next slide, let me also just really, really briefly, um, since it was mentioned in my introduction, tell you about Cambridge Zero, which is the part of the university that, that I lead in terms of the university's response to climate. It's not just about minimising the university's own climate impact through its activities, although we help support doing that. It's also really importantly and the majority of the work is around looking at how we can maximise the university's research and its education, um, as well as actually its convening power um, to together find solutions to climate change. And some of the things that I will be bringing out in this presentation, I'll draw on some of the work that we're doing um, as part of that. So, let me start off um, with this. What I want to do over the next um, few minutes is really set the scene for you in terms of the scale of the climate challenge in particular, how that sits in that broader set of societal challenges, and therefore then where are the opportunities for, for innovation. Um, you know, if there's some sort of rallying call, this is undoubtedly one. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change produces a synthesis of all the um, evidence base around climate change every five or so years. And the most recent one of those synthesis reports came out in the spring of this year. 
And this is just one of the headline statements from that report. Um, that report is a by a construct, a very conservative document. Um, it's conservative in the sense that it relies on published literature, it's a synthesis of that published literature, um, and then the summary for policymakers from which this is drawn is approved by all governments. Um, so the whole process means that it's not prone to um, hugely dramatic statements, and yet this is a hugely dramatic statement, that there's a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And obviously this has been thought of through a climate lens within this particular report, but you know, whichever one of the other <laughs> global challenges that you look at, you might say, reinforce this message still further. So that, in a sense, is the challenge that we're all responding to. I thought I'd put up just a few key facts around the climate side, um, and really climate and nature, actually, um, in particular. Um, many of you be very familiar with these, but you know we know we're seeing or climate change is threatening lives and livelihoods around the world today. It's literally the case that you turn on the news any day now and you see another story of some climate disaster, most li recently the floods um, in Libya, where we still don't know how many thousands of people have died as a consequence of those floods. And, you know, in almost all of those examples, the real human impact, that impact on lives and livelihoods, is precisely that intersection between the extreme weather conditions and societal conditions. So in Libya, uh, it, there was a, a dam that broke. Heavy rainfall was, the, in one sense, the cause, but in many other senses, there was a whole plethora of other causes. Obviously, conflict in the region, but inability to put in place early warning systems and so forth. Um, We've also seen, seeing at the same time as a climate crisis, a huge crisis in terms of the natural world. Um, there was a very um, important report that came out a couple of years ago now. Um, one of the key conclusions of that is that there are a million species um, at risk of extinction over the coming decades. I was actually giving a lecture to my own PhD students. Um, we've got a PhD program here um, in Cambridge um, looking at the application of AI to the study of environmental risks and the new cohort of students arrived this week. Um, I was talking to them this morning and um, we were discussing a um, recent scientific publication that had been bringing together a summary of all the studies that have been published in in recent years, particularly around biodiversity loss. And um, this uh, study said, in, you know, having brought together that synthesis, that anybody seeing that synthesis together, even people who are experts in the field, would be aghast at the scale of the, of the, of the threats um, when, when you see them collectively together. And in fact, actually, I've seen, seen Richard at the, at the back here, who often, uh, I, I'm a fellow of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, um, as is Richard. And I, you know, I know I've seen this time and time and again, when we have speakers coming in to talk to um, audiences about sustainability, one of the things that they repeatedly tell us is that when they see all the information together in one place, even if they know it's still shocking to see it um, together in one place. Um, let's just run around the rest of this slide um, to provide that shocking picture. Um, tropical forest area almost the size of England, lost in 2021, the same size of area in 2022. It's every year that scale of loss, and it's cumulative. So every year, tropical forest the size of England drop down and a huge impact both in terms of the biodiversity through that habitat loss and in terms of climate change because of the impact on carbon uptake. Another interlinked environmental challenge is air pollution. Um, air pollution both from um, indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution, most of that being generated at the same time as burning of fossil fuels, so intimately linked to the climate change challenge. Um, and it's estimated that 7 million people die prematurely every year as a consequence of air, air pollution. And then if we just um, run along the bottom, which are perhaps more of the societal challenges that interlink with those environmental challenges, um, more than a billion people living in areas of high or extremely high water vulnerability, that vulnerability exacerbated by climate change. 
almost a, bi a billion people living in famine-like conditions. Again, those famine-like conditions, close interaction with um, climate change. Um, and then the societal inequalities in terms of um, the vast disparity in, in wealth between the richest and the poorest, and the implications that has in terms of um, quality of people's lives, just the example there of um, a, a third of the global population not having access to clean cooking. And of course, all of these things feed directly into the sustainable development goals, and we all know how little progress there's been made across most of those sustainability goals. Um, Just a couple of you know, additional points that I was going to make um, very quickly, particularly associated with the climate dimension. Um, I've mentioned that we're now seeing climate change affecting every um, region across the globe. We've seen some really extreme examples of that just in the last um, few weeks. Um, I thought I'd just, in terms of setting the, the scale of the, of the challenge, just show you quite how rapidly the world has been changing in recent times. Um, this is the sort of work that um, I do uh, a lot of analysis of, understanding how the world's changed over the last, this is showing um, 170 years, um, and the key measures associated with climate change. So you see that you know, almost exponential growth in terms of world energy use. And if you look closely, you will see very tiny, tiny increase in um, the percentage of renewables. A really important increase, but starting from an incredibly low base. Um, carbon dioxide levels increasing, continuing to increase, accelerating in terms of their increase, um, now edging towards 420 parts per million in the atmosphere, when for millions of years, they've never been higher than about 280 parts per million. Temperature now 1.1, 1.2 degrees. Celsius warmer than it was in the um, 1850s. That sounds like a small number, but translates into a very large increase in the risk of extreme events. Those floods in Libya that, I, that we've seen over the last few days, a careful analysis that's been undertaken in, in, in recent days associated with that has indicated that the rainfall, the heavy rainfall that occurred, that was the, the main cause of those um, floods was considered to be a one in 600 year event. And the amount of rainfall, um, the risk of having that level of heavy rainfall estimated to be 50 times higher, five zero times higher as a consequence of the climate change that we've already seen to date. Essentially because a warmer atmosphere holds more water to be able to rain down in heavy rainfall events. Um, and then the final example that I've got here is um, sea level rise, where we've seen about a quarter of a metre of sea level rise um, to date. Sea, le sea levels rise response is much slower um, than other parts of the climate system because it rises through melting of ice, which is a relatively slow process, and through the warming of the ocean, which is also a relatively slow process um, because the ocean is deep and um, water has a large heat capacity. One really important um, point, I mentioned the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, and uh, the fact that the most recent report, the sixth assessment report of that, um, came out earlier this year. One really important point um, is that the analysis that's been undertaken as part of those reports, um, in each report, the kind of global conclusions of the risks posed by climate change to society has increased substantially each time. And um, as a way of summarizing the findings as a whole, there's been a development of these, this particular diagram that you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, which sometimes gets called the burning embers diagram. Um, and it looks at aggregating different categories of risk to give a sense of how much of a global challenge climate change is. Um, and looks at those risks at each different level of temperature increase that we might see into the future. So, as I said, we're about 1.1, 1.2 degrees of warming today. Um, Paris Agreement and, and, and subsequent um, uh, international agreements have um, 
indicated we want to keep temperatures well below 2 degrees with an ambition to keep them below 1.5 degrees. We're currently on course for more like 3 degrees of warming. And so you can read across these, the temperature increase is on the vertical axis. You can read across and look at the level of risk according to the colour in each of those different categories. AR5 and AR6, AR5 was the last assessment report of the IPCC, AR6 is the present one. And so you see that if you go read across, um, where you move from uh, the, the yellow, which is sort of moderate risk, into the red, which is high risk, it's moved down to a lower level, assessed a bit at a lower level of temperature increase. So the risks are still high at lower level of temperature increase than, than was previously um, understood to be the case. I particularly draw your attention, though, to this last category, which in, in this conservative polite language gets called large-scale singular events. And large-scale singular events basically translates as catastrophic tipping points. Um, and so the sorts of things that are at risk under those catastrophic tipping points are shown on the right-hand side there. They include the dieback of the Amazon rainforest, switching from a rainforest into a savanna, some of which we're already seeing um, happening today. There's an indication that the Amazon has already switched from being a sink of carbon to being a source of carbon through that combination of climate change and deforestation. The middle image um, looks like an innocuous circle um, within a lake. That uh, circle is actually a bubble of methane that's coming out of an Arctic lake. Uh, throughout the Arctic, there are vast stores of methane frozen in the ground or in the lakes or in the, or in the sea. And as the Arctic is warming up, which it's doing at four times the rate of the rest of the world, as the Arctic is warming up, methane is coming out of that frozen stores into the atmosphere. And methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so this is a, an, a way in which you can get a significant acceleration of climate change. And perhaps the most frightening is the bottom picture. And the bottom picture is a photograph from Antarctica. In Greenland and in Antarctica, there are vast ice sheets covering um, the continents. And um, there's real concerns that between about 1.5 and 2 degrees of warming, um, that might pass the threshold in which those ice sheets are no longer um, intact. And we know that that's happened in the past. If you look back in the, um, in the records uh, that we have as to um, the state of those ice sheets in the distant past when the world's been in a warmer state, when the Earth's been in a different orbit around the sun, um, then we know that those ice sheets weren't intact and sea levels were many metres higher than they are today as a consequence. Uh, the collapse of those ice sheets would completely transform global coastlines and displace hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. So concern about tipping points is very, very great. So that's the kind of state in terms of the climate system. What do we need to be doing about it? And therefore, where do we need to be starting to think in a more exciting and um, enthusiastic way about innovation to help uh, us avert that potential disaster? Um, so this is essentially where the challenge is at a global level on the mitigation side of climate change, on the emissions reduction side of climate change. I'll come back to the other um, key element of our response to climate change in terms of adaptation in a minute. Um, what you see here is global emissions of carbon dioxide in the white dots. So that's where we're not exactly tackling climate change because every year our global emissions of climate change, uh, carbon dioxide have been going up rather than down. Um, you can see if you look really closely that there's a very tiny little dip down associated with the pandemic um, when we had essentially the lockdown of global economies and it made a slight dent. Um, but the next year, we were almost back to uh, where we were in 2019. So slight dip down in 2020. Um, and then we basically recovered to the 2019 values. Yes. What happened in 99? Uh, so what happened in 99? So these are carbon dioxide emissions. And what I believe is that this was actually um, as a result of a significant number of Indonesian wildfires. Um, and so there was a slight increase in carbon dioxide emissions as a consequence of those um, really strong wildfires, and that's why you saw a little uptick. Um, 
The blue is a kind of envelope of trajectories, the sort of pathway that we need to be on as a global society if we are to have a reasonable chance of keeping um, temperature rise below that 1.5 degrees. Um, and you can see the scale of the challenge. It's quite significant. Um, and uh, we're simply not on track for that at the moment as a global economy. Um, so what, you know, what can and should we, we all be doing, right? So we, you know, we've got a choice of what we can do to contribute to this. So what could, could we all be doing to help try and contribute to this? Um, Actually taking more than we're yes. putting out? Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah, so everyone focuses on net zero and they say, oh, well, we need to be net zero by 2050. And you can see here where that comes from. Mm -hmm. But net zero isn't the end point, unfortunately. So after, you know, thereafter, you pretty much have to be actually taking more out than you're putting in. Um, right. So, so much for the bad news. The good news is that the IPCC said that feasible, effective, and low-cost options for mitigation and adaptation are already available. Um, and I'm sorry, I said I would say a little bit about adaptation, and these really do go together. It's about um, looking at reducing our emissions, but also building resilience for the climate impacts that we're already experiencing. And this balance between mitigation and Adaptation, of course, is different for different countries of the world, and that's really important in, the, in this context of social innovation um, to recognise. Um, there's a desire for all countries to follow a low carbon, a climate, um, net zero, but also resilient um, future pathway, and seeing the two in tandem and understanding where solutions can be put together that address both and don't compromise either one is really important. So IPCC, it's partly about the climate science, which I've presented a significant amount, um, but it's also looking at solutions and drawing together the global evidence base around solutions. And there was some very interesting um, analysis in the most recent report about what characteristics those um, effective and feasible solutions have. Um, right in the centre of here is, I think, probably the most important um, point, which is... I would go even further than the IPCC. IPCC said fairness is one of the solutions. I mean, everything that I've ever undertaken, I would say that fairness has to be absolutely at the heart of any of the solutions. Um, there was a very interesting analysis in the well, or project that was conducted in the, in the UK um, a couple of years ago now, um, where there was a climate assembly um, put together um, and ran over multiple months, um, bringing together ordinary citizens to look at what potential solutions um, in a UK context there might be to climate change. And the number one finding that came out was fairness needed to be at the heart of everything. Um, and uh, and it, it, it's not just because that's the right thing to do, it's because solutions that don't take account of fairness fail. Um, so I think the other things that were the key findings um, in the IPCC are probably relatively um, obvious. Tried and tested options are already available now. They're just not being implemented. Um, solutions need to be designed for diverse context. Um, real desire to scale up and apply widely. And that enabling policies can help um, overcome some of the critical barriers. Now, often, the solutions to climate change get thought of as purely technological. And there's a lot of work being undertaken in the university here on many of those te technological solutions. Um, people in the chemistry department studying new battery technologies, um, people in the engineering department looking at, at ways of removing carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere through technological um, means, um, people uh, looking at new ways of... Um, uh, replacing cement as a um, building material, etc., etc. A lot of that technological um, research being undertaken, and that's really important, but it's not the complete answer to climate change by any means. Um, there was some in interesting analysis undertaken by the Committee for Climate Change in the UK, um, which is uh, represented in this pie chart here, looking at um, potential pathways for the UK towards net zero. And the role of technological solutions compared to 
behavioural solutions, solutions that involve, involve changes to people's lifestyles. Um, and those solutions that are involve a bit of both. And so you, in their assessment, um, the pathways that they looked at, approximately 40% of those pathways were um, as a result of technological change, but 60% was as a result of um, changes that involved behavioural change as well as technological um, change. And that's where social innovation really comes in. You know, this is the, we cannot deliver net zero without social innovation as well as technological innovation. So what are some of the potential um, opportunities for social innovation? And there are just loads across every different element. Um, so there's lots of activity um, in particular around community-based action. Um, from small projects looking at community um, gardens to much larger um, projects that are transforming <coughs> entire cities. Um, Bristol in the, in the UK is an example where there's lots and lots of community-based projects that are specifically focused um, around um, climate solutions. Huge opportunities in terms of digital technologies and smart um, uh, systems. <coughs> Lots of really exciting work um, being undertaken, for example, on using digital platforms to better connect together smallholder farmers with markets and at the same time providing those smallholder farmers with um, information to help them manage their um, uh, agriculture in, in, a, in a, a more climate resilient way using less fertilizer because they have better information in terms of the weather conditions um, and, uh, and altogether enabling them to, to, to be able to conduct their activities in a more efficient way. Um, so huge opportunities uh, around using technology um, to create solutions that involve both climate but also societal benefits at the same time. Lots and lots of interest. Um, people in Judge Business School looking at um, new business models that are central to the circular economy, whether they're novel ways or in all sorts of different environments of reducing waste. Huge um, opportunities for, again, projects that deliver climate benefit and societal benefit at the same time. Those are some of the direct solutions, but then all sorts of educational solutions or climate advocacy um, solutions that are being developed. Again, looking at really innovative ways of, very importantly, giving underrepresented groups a better voice um, in terms of the climate uh, debate. Critically important when climate interfaces so much in terms of uh, the inequalities that we see across society and where so often we find that many of the solutions to climate change are already held within communities and groups, um, particularly many uh, in, in a local context and often their voices are not traditionally being elevated and so they're not being brought in as part of solutions. And if uh, mechanisms and, and new models can be uh, developed to enable uh, those voices to be accessed better, um, then that can also be part of a solution. The financial system, socially, socially responsible investing, creating the, the tools and innovating around the tools that help support um, socially responsible investing, whether that's in terms of um, creating um, uh, creating innovations to help connect with the relevant data sets or to support transparency associated with um, a responsible investing or to help people access that responsible investing should they wish to. Um, we've got work in the university looking at um, innovation around carbon credits. Um, there's a very interesting relatively new centre in the university, our Centre for Carbon Credits, which is bringing together computer scientists and conservationists, people from the, from the David Attenborough building, from the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. Um, they are particularly looking at um, carbon credits in a, in a broader sense than they're often looked at. They are trying to come up, well, they have come up with a comprehensive framework for um, analysing a potential carbon credit for obviously the carbon impact it has, but not just um, immediately, but on looking at um, the, uh, 
the long-term impact of that carbon credit. So in a simple terms, I always try and think of it through a tree. So if you have a tree, you have carbon credit, you plant a tree, you have carbon credit associated with that tree, but, um, and you might want to protect that tree from deforestation. But if you're protecting that tree from deforestation whilst you're not protecting somewhere over here, then your net result is not beneficial because you, you know, you, one tree's protected here, but the other one's been chopped down over here. So that gets um, termed as leakage. Um, or another problem is you might um, plant a tree and then the next week someone comes and chops it down. So then there's no additionality. So you want to both track what's happening around the area that you're doing your particular carbon credit on, seeing what impacts that's having, and also monitor it over time. Um, so those are two criteria. But there's a third criteria which is really important, which is that a scheme, if it's um, a scheme associated with, um, you know, such as tree planting um, or avoided uh, deforestation, um, might have many other both biological, biodiversity um, benefits, but really, really importantly, social benefits as well. And so you might want to try and find a way of incorporating those into um, your um, carbon credits as well, so that you can intercompare a project that might have a lot of societal or biodiversity benefits, as well as carbon benefits, from a purely technological project that's just literally sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and doesn't have those broader benefits. And you might want to be able to intercompare the two. So what uh, this project in Cambridge has been undertaking is creating a robust framework to take into account of each of those different um, dimensions. And then where the computer scientists have uh, become involved is by effectively using a, a type of blockchain technology to then attach that information to the carbon credit in the digital form so that as it's the carbon credit is traded, that information is passed on with it. So just one example of some really innovative work that's being undertaken at that boundary between climate and societal benefits. Um, and then the final one that I put down here, because it, it, you know, it's clearly so important, is broadly around education and training for a just transition. Um, you know, if we are really to rapidly, on that really accelerated timescale, wholesale change society across every different sector of the economy, it, it needs to be supported in particular by skills training. And there's a huge opportunity there for uh, what currently is essentially a vacuum um, in terms of globally providing those skills um, for that very rapid but needs to be just transition. So there, I'm sure you could think of many, many, many other examples, but I've tried to just give a a flavour of the different ways in which social innovation, there's clearly huge opportunities in the climate space for social innovation. I then wanted just to um, say a few words about, well, so we've got a huge global challenge, but that's also huge opportunities, particularly for people who are interested in social innovation. But what are some of the kind of characteristics of really successful social innovation in this space? Um, and um, so there's three things that, um, in particular, I've seen in the work that we're undertaking in the university. This is actually not unique to innovation. This is just as much in terms of the research that we're undertaking as being absolutely central components um, to, uh, in this particular domain, to successful innovation. Um, so the first one is to do with the time scale. So there needs to be you know, accelerated innovation. The time scale of which we need to have this rapid global response is really short. And so anything that we can find, any mechanisms we can find to accelerate the innovation time scale um, is, uh, is going to be essential. We've been looking at this in different contexts um, in the university. Um, there's a lot of work looking at how we can accelerate the time scale of technological innovations. Um, the, our engineering department has been working with um, some of the engineers from Formula One who race to race are very good at innovating rapidly um, because that, there's a strong incentive for them to do so and looking to see whether we can deploy some of the techniques that they use in Formula One to accelerate the innovation in some of our um, engineering uh, departments. So I think it's be very interesting to think through in the context of social innovation 
what's this, what's the equivalent? How you know what are the things that need to be put in place to really accelerate innovation in terms of um, social innovation? Um, the second thing that I have down here is holistic systems, um, and what I mean by that is that um, it, in terms of climate solutions, it is very clear um, that there are interconnections across every different dimension of society, that you can't undertake a project um, that's associated with the transport system in some way without considering um, energy systems, without considering um, the design of cities, without considering... You, know, you quickly find that there are multiple, multiple different perspectives that are necessary for one individual project, multiple, multiple different stakeholders that are necessary to, to interact with one particular project. Um, we've been trying to institute this in the, in the university on the research side um, by really bringing in very interdisciplinary groups to um, look at any of the research challenges that we're undertaking. So to give you an example, we relatively recently um, set up a new centre for landscape regeneration um, in the university. And this involves academics from 15 different departments of the university, many science and technology disciplines, as well as many um, disciplines on the social sciences uh, of the university. Uh, the first landscape that we've been looking at has been the Fenlands around Cambridge in East Anglia and they're a really interesting landscape. I'm sure there's lots of potential for social innovation in amongst uh, this story as well by the way. Um, so the, the big challenge with the Fenlands, they were um, originally underwater. This was all marshland in the 17th century and they were drained with the help of Dutch engineers in the 17th century um, and the resultant peatland has been a very rich soil for agriculture. So if you go um, north of Cambridge, you see very, very flat land, famous for its big skies, um, uh, flat for, you know, forever, um, but field after field of intensively farmed um, landscape. And that has, well, it starts off seeming like two challenges, but you quickly add on other challenges on top of it. So the immediate challenges from the climate perspective is that that peatland when it's intensively farmed, is emitting large amounts of carbon emissions. The challenge from the farming perspective is that those carbon emissions are essentially because the soil dries out and it literally blows away. And so the peatland is actually really rapidly disappearing. Um, and so there are places where 30% of the peatland has disappeared just in the last 10 years. And it, you go, roll forward another couple of decades and there won't be any peatland left um, to be farmed. So the farmers know that there's an existential threat just from the loss of the peatland. Um, but then it turns out there are other challenges as well. There are challenges in terms of the biodiversity. Some of this area was one of the richest parts of the country in terms of biodiversity. Many uh, uh, um, important species have been lost. Challenges in terms of water. Um, so this is one of the driest parts of the country and there are severe risks of water shortages. Uh, Cambridge itself is really water stressed. Um, and uh, actually there's currently a halt on quite a number of the development projects in Cambridge because the Environment Agency has said there's not enough water for those development projects. Um, and um, at the same time, being very flat, and very low level, not much above sea level, there are real concerns about flooding. Um, and then finally, the Fenlands are one of the most deprived parts of the country. Huge social inequalities. If you look at any of the deprivation indices, then the communities, as soon as you get outside of Cambridge and into the fence, they're some of the most deprived parts of the country. And so the holistic systems analysis that we've been undertaking is to draw all these different components together um, to bring together a huge academic disciplinary base to look at the challenge of how could we manage this land differently into the future for the benefit of climate and nature and the people who live and work in those um, landscapes. Um, working with a really broad range of different stakeholders, all the different forms of local government in the region, um, the farming community, uh, the conservation community, and the um, people working in public health um, who have a critical role across the region, uh, with the schools in the region, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, trying to find solutions, and coming back to an earlier point I mentioned, trying to 
listen really carefully to those people who know the landscape really well, whether it's the farmers, whether it's conservation communities, whether it's the fishermen, whether, you know, whoever it is, um, because many times they have the solutions. Um, but they also really importantly want to feel listened to and it's that fairness being a critical part of the solution that's essential as well. The third thing I have on here is radical collaboration. Um, radical collaboration actually we found intersects absolutely with the accelerated innovation. We're finding many of the ways in which we get accelerated uh, uh, innovation is precisely through radical collaboration and it intersects absolutely with the holistic systems analysis I just described because in a sense what uh, you know, a critical part of that is radical collaboration with um, different groups that we wouldn't traditionally have thought of working with um, through the university. Um, I have been saying there's a big project at the moment um, in Cambridge uh, called Innovate Cambridge. It has its launch on the 11th of October, looking at how we can create a step change in the innovation ecosystem um, in Cambridge. And I've been working with that um, project uh, involves the university and other um, bodies that are interested in innovation in the Cambridge region. Um, I've been on the steering committee of, of Innovate Cambridge as it's been developing over the last nine months. Um, and one of the things that I have been emphasising, um, there's always uh, a desire, and, and, and really with really good reason, for place-based innovation districts. That's been the traditional model, and Cambridge looks to Kendall Square, or it looks to San Diego to say, we want to be like that. Um, you know, we have a good e innovation ecosystem here, but not nearly as good as us. And one of the things that I've been emphasizing is, at least in my vision of the world, I think that we could be thinking of ourselves much more as being a hub of innovation here, where we can get the benefits of that place-based ecosystem but also that critically helps to unlock innovation that happens elsewhere. Um, because particularly in the climate context, I'm very aware um, that some of the um, places in the world that have the most challenges in terms of uh, innovation needs associated with climate change are not here in the UK. And many, as, we, as I've been emphasizing, many of the solutions to the challenges in countries throughout Africa, for example, are in the communities in Africa. We might be able to help and assist, maybe with access to finance, maybe with some of the technologies we have in the university, but the solutions need to be based in location. And so if we could think of ourselves not just as an innovation district here in Cambridge, but as a hub that then helps to support and unlock innovation that happens elsewhere, I think we could have much more of a global influence, but that's just my view. Um, so all of this comes together, the accelerated innovation, holistic systems analysis, radical collaboration, that sense that the, unlike uh, some other f forms of innovation where you might have a, a, you know, a theory that, well, you just want to let a thousand flowers bloom and which other ones will be successful. In the climate context, there's a very time-bound challenge that needs addressing. And so really to be effective in terms of innovation in that context, I believe it's impossible to separate innovation from the regulatory and the policy framework that helps accelerate that innovation, because that's the only way that you get solutions to a particular challenge over a really short time frame. So again, that's another sense in which you need to have that radical collaboration. And the desire out of all of this, we talk, I talked about tipping points in the climate system in terms of ice sheet collapse and so forth. The ultimate desire, and the only way that we get the change happening on the timescale required, is if innovations can then unlock tipping points, societal tipping points. Whether that's in terms of the tipping points we may already be starting to approach in terms of electric vehicles suddenly you know, being adopted at scale around the world, but that needs to happen across every single different part of the global economy. Accessing those tipping points is the only way that we're going to be able to get the global change on the timescale that's required. I've been talking too much, it's gone off. <laughs> But actually, no, not only have I been talking too much, but that is basically where I wanted to end and then maybe take a few questions. Um, and this is the, just the final thing that I was going to um, put up, which is another statement from the most recent IPCC report as to why this is so important, because our choices will reverberate for hundreds, even thousands of years. So as social 
innovators, this is the challenge to you. Your choices today will have will make a difference to the world for generations and generations to come. I'll leave it there.